Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. good to be born again. You know, I was uh, in Sunday school this morning, and uh, we were talking about discernment and what it means, and uh, we really didn't get too far into the lesson itself, surprise, surprise, but um, we did uh, get to talk about certain topics uh, that are a little harder to be discerning with than others because they're so deceptive, they're so, they're so seductive. And I made a statement. I've heard, I've heard preachers make, make a particular statement, and, um, you know, it became a cliche. And I, I don't know how many people have ever heard the statement, my um, best day or my worst day saved is, was better than my best day lost. Anybody ever heard that statement? Now, in our area, that was huge. I mean, you'd hear preachers, they'd get up there, and, they, and it never, I, I, never, I never quite understood it. Uh, no doubt about it, my uh, worst day saved when it comes to eternity was way better than my best day lost. Uh, but in class today, we, we were talking about some of those things, and I didn't go into details with my life, but there are memories I have before I knew Jesus Christ as my Savior that are pretty good. And I wouldn't trade them in for, for anything that this world has. Um, and I've had some pretty good days as a lost man. I had some fun. I, I, I did. I'm not talking about sin and those types of things. I'm just talking about relationships and people and memories of, of places I've been and seen and, and fun things that's happened throughout the years. And the difference now, as I look back and discerning those things, is this. No matter what kind of fun it was, it doesn't compare to what Christ has in store for me each and every day of my life. And, um, you know, if you want a good, victorious day in Christ, look at your day and anything that draws you away from God, even a little bit, just chuck that thing aside for a moment and watch what the Holy Spirit does. Uh, but it's hard to discern what things are keeping us away from God in this life, isn't it? Uh, because it gets so seductive. But anyway, it was just kind of a, that's free today and a, a little thought for you to ponder over these next few days. I don't know if there's ever going to be a message on it or not, but uh, God really spoke to me through the teen boys this morning as we were talking. Uh, but in the meantime, um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to finish out chapter 8 today in the book of Ezra. Um, and we've got two more chapters to go. Chapter 8. Um, uh, it, it completes the second coming out of the children of Israel from the Persian Empire um, under King Artaxerxes. And um, Ezra led them out. We, we left off last week at verse 21. And what had happened up to that point, um, Ezra, they gathered uh, by, uh, by the river that leads to Ahaza. And he looks around. And they're getting ready to go on this journey, a long, long, treacherous and dangerous journey. And as he's looking out at all those that were gathered there to come out, he noticed somebody was missing. A group of people were missing. And that group was what was called the Levites. Um, those Levites' job was to make sure that God's people had a place to go to, to make sure uh, that um, the, the house of God was taken care of, to make sure... Uh, that when there was uh, a need for prayer and sacrifice and supplication, they were there to provide that service for God's people. And as Ezra looked out, he didn't see any of them. He immediately stopped and he put some men together, some wise men, and he said, I want you to head over there into that area. He pointed to him, told him to go to Kasika, and he said, I want you to go talk to Edo, and I want you to tell him very wisely that we need the Levites on this journey. We cannot make it without them. And the, the Edo was a very influential man. 
um, with the children of Israel, with the Jews over there in that land. For some reason, that's where a lot of the Levites ended up. And as they went there, and these men spoke to Edo, Edo went to uh, God's people, the Levites, in that land, and he, in that city, and he told him the necessity of them going on this journey to go back to the temple. And a few of the Levites said, yes, we'll go. And along with the Levites, of course, comes the Nithiams, who were the servants. Um, a lot, or, uh, Ezra, um, at that point, thanks the good hand of the Lord uh, for providing him men that were wise that he could send, for providing him a connection over in the land of Cassica, and providing everything that was needed to get a needed ministry into the presence of the congregation of God's people. And I cannot underestimate the importance of godly men who take a stand, who are doctrinally sound, to lead God's people through these dangerous times that we live in today. It is of utmost importance that the sheep have a shepherd, and that that shepherd is following the great shepherd up in heaven. And without that, the journey will be plagued with very much death. Ezra understood that. And that's where we come to. We're in verse 20. So um, if you look at Ezra chapter 8, verse 20, if I can find it here. Ezra 8, verse 20. First, Second Chronicles, Ezra. The only way I remember where Ezra is is I know it's somewhere around Second Chronicles because he wrote that. And somewhere around Nehemiah, because he was all part of that. So uh, somewhere in the midst there, and there it is, right in the middle of them both. So if you can't remember where a book is, remember where the two on the other, each and every other side of it, especially with these small books. Um, I have a problem finding Job, and I know exactly where it's at. Um, Job's another one that I have a problem finding, knowing exactly where it's at. But anyway, the Bible says in verse 21, it says, uh, after all this happened that I just told you, it said, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Hava, Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon them for good, uh, for, for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted. And besought our God for this, and he was entreated, the Bible says, of us. Now, as, as we read these uh, three scriptures that we just read, 20, 21, and 22, I want you to notice verse 21. What's happening here is he's proclaiming a fast right there at that river uh, that leads to Ahava. And he says that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him, what does it say? A right way for us. You see, at this time, uh, Ezra and God's people had been afforded a great opportunity of liberty to leave their bondage. The king said, you can go. All right. And what happened um, was Ezra looked at the king, and the king is wanting to offer these things, and he says, our, our God will take care of us. The good hand of our God, he is upon us. He'll take care of us, King Artaxerxes. And then what happens as they're gathered there, and they get the Levites in there, Ezra is staring out at the con congregation, and he begins to look at the children. He begins to look at the women. He begins to look at the elderly. He begins to look at the, the crippled and, and those that were beaten down. He begins to see that this long journey ahead of them that's going to be filled with a lot of enemies, there's a possibility that the little ones, the elderly, those that aren't uh, combat, are able to combat, able to fight, there's a good chance that they are going to fall by the wayside. So what does he do? Look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. The Bible says this in verse 22. For I was ashamed, I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. You see, up to this point, things have been going very well for Ezra. Things have been going very well for those that chose 
uh, the, to made the decision that they were going to make this journey. Ezra and God's children had been given the great blessing of liberty, afforded them by our taxis, yet they did not take away the importance nor the need to call out to God. You see, in verse 21, Ezra sees these little ones. He realizes there's an issue. There's a temptation that's starting to arise in Ezra's heart. And he realizes, I need to go to God. I can't keep them safe. I can't protect them. I mean, you're talking over 5,000 people that Ezra's leading out of here. There is no way that he is going to be able to protect each and every person that is in that congregation. So what does he cry out to God for? He wants to know the right way. He wants to know what it is that he needs to do. And he did it by proclaiming a fast. You see, the Bible talks about fasting a lot. How many, and don't raise your hand, but I want you to ask yourself this question. Without an excuse, why you don't do it. Without a reason, why you don't do it. I want you to ask yourself why you do not fast when there's a need. Now, if you do, praise the Lord. Why not? You realize there's some things that all the prayers in the world ain't going to help you with? Take a look at Jesus when he's, uh, when he's talking to the disciples and he just got done, uh, he's a demon's present and, and uh, he's getting ready to work on this thing and he tells his disciples, he says, basically this, it's going to take more than prayer. Some of them aren't going to come out unless you fast. So there are things in our life that only fasting and prayer is going to take care of. Not just the one, not just the other one, but both of them. So if you've not fasted, you are doing yourself a very great disservice when it comes to the blessings of God. And you say, well, I can't this and I can't. I said without excuses. What is a fast? I mean, if you, if you say you can't fast... There's a reason why. But if you don't know what a fast is, how do you know the reason you can't? How do you know what you got to give up? How do you know what you got to quit doing for that day? Why do you have to do it? What's the reasoning? Uh, God knows my heart. God knows my prayers. Yes, he does. But he knows you're serious when you're willing to give something up of your flesh. I'm not talking about Lent and all that stuff. You know, some people think that a fast is a 24-hour period of time, and that's it. You don't eat all day. You have your last meal. And then you do 24 hours without eating, without drinking, without doing anything. And that's a fast. Well, that, that is a fast, but that's not what it requires. Not every fast is the same. Some fast, I knew a lady back home, uh, Sister Carla, she was my pastor's wife, and she had a pressing need in her life. And you know what she did? She went to God and she told God, I am going to fast until I get direction from you. She went five days, didn't eat a thing. She drank a lot of water. Um, she still took her supplements and all that stuff that she had to take for her health. She didn't have to give up her medication. She didn't have to give up her pills. I know preachers that tell people, listen, if you're going to fast, you have to quit taking your medicine. I don't buy that for a heartbeat, for, for, for a second. What a fast is, is you take something in your life. We just assume it's food these days because we love food. But you take something in your life and you don't mess with that. For me, when I fast, I go usually a 24-hour period of time or a 48-hour period of time where I will not eat food. I'll drink water like it's going out of style. I occasionally will have a cup of coffee. But what I'm telling God, what I'm, what I'm, with the message I'm sending my Savior is the answer to this issue in my life is more important than that Big Mac sandwich. It's more important than that steak. It's more important than that, that, that macaroni. It's more important than the food that I love so much. And um, that gets God's attention and lets him know that you're serious. So an excuse not to fast is just that. It's an excuse. If you really want to get serious about some issues in your life, pray and fast. Give something up. Flesh, give, give it up. You don't have to talk about it. You don't have to tell people, but do it. Because if you do, you're going to see a blessing of God like you've never experienced before. So Ezra proclaimed a fast. And uh, I want to make this point. No matter how good you may have it concerning God, do not forget who got you there. Ezra didn't forget. He said, the good hand of our God. He used that statement a few times uh, throughout the Bible. Um, never stop calling out to him and praying 
for his arm of leading, praying for his arm of power, praying for his arm of provision, of protection, of a providence. You see, God's got all these things in store for you, but you need to seek him to get direction so that you know what is the right way, what is um, the good way for you, as Ezra said, uh, the, the good way for us in verse 21. Uh, we tend to call out God when we have a pressing need, but then we forget to call out to him when things are good. Call out to him always. You see, God's always making a way for us to grow. He's always making a way for us to move forward. He's always making a way for us to get out of the bondage that's keeping us away from him. And sometimes through our calling out to him, when things seem good, he shows us and gives us direction concerning some dangers that are ahead for us that we wouldn't have otherwise known. You see, Ezra sees these kids. Ezra sees these, 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 these elderly and the sick and the weak. And he realizes that the next five months, they're gonna be, there's going to be a target on them. It was good right then. They were safe. But he knew that dangers were in the future. So he called out to God. Now, as we get to verse 22, he says, For I am ashamed to require of the king. Now, there is no sugarcoating what Ezra's doing here. None at all. Uh, I heard, heard a guy, he said that that word require is not Ezra feeling bad. It's just the opposite. Well, it's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, for I am ashamed. So that tells you there's something going on there. He is ashamed to require of the king. Why is that? So what he says, for I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Why was that? Well, simply, if you read verse 22, the rest of it, you'll see why. Here's what he says. He says, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and wrath is against all them that forsake him. You know why he was ashamed? Because here he is worried about his congregation. And rather than go to God, he was tempted to go to the king. And what would have happened had he went to our taxis? What do you think that would have done as far as our taxis is concerned? Have you ever told somebody... I'm just going to trust God. I'm just going to trust God through this. He's going to get me through it. He's going to get me through it. About a week later, you're on your knees crying for God, saying, I need to do something, God. You're not helping me. And what do you do? You run off somewhere else and get help from somewhere else. What does that do to all those that saw you? I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. This is an extreme example of that. Ezra knew that if he went to our tax receipts, and, at, and that was the logical thing to do, right? I mean, why not? The king's offered his hand. Why not use them? Why not get a few horses? Why not get a few soldiers? Why not let them put a circle around us as we, as we travel to this road to Jerusalem that's filled with our enemies on every side? That's the logical thing to do, right? Well, he knew that if he did that, that our taxi would have a different view on his God. He knew that he would have a different view on him. Well, I thought you said you trusted God. Why are you here asking for my help? I thought you said you trusted God. Why are you doing this? I thought you said you trusted God. Why are you doing this? I talk to drug addicts sometimes, and they'll tell me how much they love the Lord and how much they trust him. But then when I ask them, why do they go to the drug den instead of God for the answers? They say, oh, you know how it is. I used to know how it was, and I used to know that I went there because I thought it had the answers and not God. So the, the point is here. It's very simple. Trust God. If you believe he can get you through it, then let him get you through it. You don't need the help of some king to get you through this because if you do, it brings about a bad testimony on the power that God has in your life. Sounds familiar, don't it? How many of us can raise our hand and say, I've talked about trusting God and then the first chance I got, I went somewhere else instead of him. I can raise up both my hands and I can raise up both my feet if I wouldn't fall down. There are things in my life that I was very strong in saying, I'll trust him, I'll trust him, I'll trust him. And then when the rubber hit the road, oh, I need some help. Mom, man, I, re I remember when I first got saved, I lost everything uh, that I had. And I, I had it pretty good in my lost world. Uh, the things that 
uh, that I was doing was putting a lot of, lot of money and a lot of power in my pocket. But when I lost all of it, and then I got saved, I, had, I didn't have two nickels to rub together when I got saved. And I'm talking like two or three years after a point in my life where I had anything a man could want. And, and I remember getting saved and, and talking to my pastor, yeah, I'm going to trust God, yeah, I'm going to trust God. Electric bill would come in, you know what I'm doing? Hey, Mom, I get paid Friday. I got to pay the electric bill Wednesday. Is it possible for you to front me $100 so I can pay the electric bill? Sure, Randy, sure. All right, thanks. I'll be there in about half an hour to get it. Is that trusting God? Not at all. What that did to my mom, who was lost, and I would talk about how much I trusted God around her, but then when the rubber hit the road, I'd need money. I'd come to her rather than fasting and praying to my God. It left a bad testimony for a couple of years. It was even worse when I quit asking for help and I was trusting God. She got mad at me. <laughs> I just didn't feel like I needed her no more. Uh, truth is, I didn't need her no more in that area of my life. Um, I had God. Uh, so, you know, our God will bring us through. Um, the problem is, we don't wait for him. We do every other alternative we have rather than allow him to get us through. And maybe you come out victorious, but who gets the victory when that happens? It ain't God. It's the strength of your own arm. Amen. We just wait. The Bible says, they that, mount, they that wait upon the Lord, what does it say in Isaiah 40? They'll renew their strength, right? They'll mount up wings as eagles. Isn't that right? It says you, uh, you'll get weary and you won't faint. Uh, how about that? Uh, it says and you'll walk and not faint. If we just wait on God. If we trust him, if we believe he'll get us through it, if we believe his power will give us the victory, wait for him to give it to you. And he will. You see, he told the king he would protect him. He told the king, God's going to protect me. But when he looked out at the congregation and he saw the young ones, he saw the little ones, he saw the mothers, he saw the sick, he saw the hurt, he realized they couldn't fight, knew the dangers they'd be facing as they passed through those enemy lands to get to Jerusalem. Naturally, he would go to the king for help, and that's why he was ashamed, that he would even think to call out on that king for any type of help like that. So what did he do? What did he do? The Bible says in verse 23, So we fasted and besought our God. There it is, prayer and fasting. And besought our God for this. And he was entreated of us. He fasted and sought God. Rather than go to the world for anything, for any help, why not fast and trust God instead? Verses 24 through 30, the Bible says, Then I separated twelve of the chief of the priests, Cherubah, Heshabiah, and ten of their brethren with them, and weighed unto them the silver and the gold and the vessels, even the offering of the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his lords and all of Israel, their present, had offered. I even weighed unto their hands six hundred and fifty talents of silver, and silver vessels and a hundred talents, and of gold a hundred talents, and also twenty basins of gold, and a thousand de thousand uh, rams and two, two vessels of fine copper, precious as gold. And I said unto them, Ye are holy unto God, the Lord. The vessels are the holy also. The vessels are the holy also. And the silver and the gold are a freewill offering unto the Lord God of your fathers. And I want to I wanna make something clear here. Um, whenever you see the word free will, when it comes to offerings, that's above and beyond a requirement. So you say, what, what's the point there? The point is this. God has set up his way of providing for his people. His way of providing for his house. His way of providing uh, for a place of worship. His way of providing the things that God's people needs in order to function in the world that we're in today. And one of those things that he has set up is what is called the tithe. That is 10% of what you make goes to the house of God. Without any allocation, without any put it there, spend it there, use it for that. It is a requirement. That first 10%, you have absolutely zero right to say, I want it to go to this or I want it to go to that. Everything after that is considered a free will offering. Those types of offerings, you do in fact have the right to say, I'm going to give this for that. Or I'm not going to give it all. 
So, for example, let's say, uh, Bill, say, Bill, you, you have a need. Uh, God presented the need to me that you might have. You, you really don't want to ask, but it's pretty obvious you have a need. All right, Sunday morning, we take up our tithe, and, you know, everything's good and everything's well. Maybe we'll give some of that to him. Who knows what, how it's gonna, what, what happened. All right, but then the pastor gets up here and says, we're going to take up an offering for Bill. You are not obligated to give a nickel. You're, you give what God asks you to give. And then at that point, that is a free will, free will offering that we're given to Bill. All right. If you get that backwards, what you've done is you've put yourself before God disobedient. So let's say I'm, I'm at church, I'm a member of a church, and um, there's a need in the church, and I give $500. I put $500 in an offering with a little envelope that says give to the such and such family. All right. And then after that, they take up a tithe offering. And I say, well, I already gave 500 bucks, so you know, that's part of my tithe. That's not how it works. It's not how it's set up. Free will offering, it is anything above and beyond. Anything above the requirement, which is 10%. That's what tithe means in the Bible. And that is the structure of how God has set up the church. And we, here, here, here at Cornerstone, we're, we're good. We're, we're fine. This ain't about preaching on money. But I'm just telling you that's how it's set up. So with your giving and with your offering and with your tithes, um, I would ask that you do an inventory of it. Ask yourself, am I giving the first requirement, which is the 10%, before I'm given to all the extra stuff that I'm given to? And I'll tell you something. I've, I've told some people this already that were kind of confused on this. I said, listen, I don't care if you give $1,000 a week to Cornerstone Baptist Church and you tell us where to spend the money. You're not in the will of God unless you're giving that 10% first to whatever the house of God needs. And, and if it's only 10% that you're given, and you're not giving anything extra, guess what? You're in the will of God. But if you're giving 1000 and you're not obligating it to the tithe, you're controlling where that money's going to get spent at. At that point, you've put yourself, even though you're giving way more, you've put yourself disobedient when it comes to God's way of getting money. Well, God's way of, of and, and it's, hard to, it's hard to grasp that you can give more and receive less. Whereas you can give less and receive more when it comes to the blessings of God concerning uh, these tithes and offerings. So um, anyway, uh, of God of your fathers, watch ye and keep them until ye weigh them before the chief and the priest of the Levites and the chief of the fathers of Israel at Jerusalem in the chambers of the house of the Lord. So took the priest and the Levites the weight of silver and the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem unto the house of God. Now, as you look at these scriptures and you read what they had there, that's a pretty substantial amount of belongings, amount of vessels. Um, he took immediate steps to give the priest and the Levites the charge and the oversight of this massive amount of monies and valuables. Now, just to uh, give you an idea of how much we're talking about here, they had 650 talents of silver, 100 talents of silver vessels, 100 talents of gold. You say, well, how much is that? Well, it's hard to come up in modern day numbers, but um, I'm going to uh, give you kind of an estimate here uh, to the value um, of these, assuming that a talent is about 100 pounds in American weight, not metric, it's 100 pounds in American weight. Um, there were several ancient ways of measuring what a talent is, and it ranged, they would range from 60 to 120 pounds, um, uh, depending on what region you were in. Um, so with conservative figures, that would be around 1,600 ounces of gold per talent. Think about that. What's gold going for now per ounce? How much? 200, 2,000. So you think about that in today's terms, that's quite a bit of money, right? So conservatively speaking, at say $350 per ounce of gold, and we said 2,000, all right? So conservatively, let's say 350 worldwide, the sum of one talent would be over $500,000. How many talents did they have? Quite a bit, didn't they? That makes 100 talents of gold about $50 million. 
That's insane. That does not include 750 talents of silver, nor the 20 basins of gold. This excludes the fine copper, which fine copper back then was actually brass, high-grade brass, not just your normal brass. It was a precious metal. As a matter of fact, it was more precious than gold back then. Um, so Ezra sees all of these, and he gives the task of the oversight to who? The priests and the Levites. Now, we don't have this problem here, at least that I've seen, but I, I do know some, some pastors in churches where they really get hammered about what they do with the money. And um, the, the point is this. Who has God given the oversight of the church building to? The congregation or the pastor? Hmm? The pastor. Who has to give an answer for every nickel that's spent? The congregation or the pastor? The pastor. Who gets in trouble if it's misallocated? The pastor. Who goes to prison if there's a tax issue? <laughs> the pastor. See, the pastor has a lot to answer to. That's a pretty intense charge that God's given God's men. And back then, we don't have that kind of money, $50 million here. I can't imagine uh, if we had that kind of money here, the pressure that would be on uh, the pastor as far as uh, taking care of what goes in and out of the church. Um, and I'm all for having help, and I'm all for having people that do that job, but in the end, the pastor better know where those nickels and dimes are going every single one of them and they better be going to something that helps the cause of christ regardless of what it is so um, this task was no small task and i want to point out that as a shepherd as an overseer of the flock as far as god is concerned one sheep was important enough for god to leave his throne just one that tells you the charge he has over us and our souls and doesn't the bible tell us what we are Aren't we more precious than anything this world has? We are more precious than gold to God. We are more precious than silver, than fine brass. We are more precious than all the riches of gold. And we know this because he left his throne in glory to save you. And I truly believe this 100%. If I was the only sinner in the world, God would have still left his throne to try to save me to give me an opportunity of salvation. And I can't prove that in Scripture, but all over and over you read in Scripture how important that one sheep is to God. So the task that he's given these Levites and these priests uh, cannot uh, be underestimated. The task that God has given the overseers of the flock in this world we live in today cannot be underestimated. And the last thing I want to tell you that can't be underestimated is yourself. Do you watch for your soul? Are you an overseer? Are you a shepherd of the things in your life? Uh, what, uh, what I mean by that is who, who ultimately controls the choices that you make? Is it your flesh or is it the Holy Spirit that lives within you? If it's the Holy Spirit that lives within you, you're being a good shepherd. If it's not, then you're catering to your flesh, which is not a good shepherd at all. So um, I say all that to say this. Watch over for yourself. Because God has got big plans for every one of us in this room. Or we're already in those big plans. Who knows? Verse 31. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the 12th day of the first month. Um, that is April, April 12th. Um, they were uh, camped out there for three to four days um, uh, there at uh, the river that goes to Ahava to go to Jerusalem. And here it is again. And the hand of our God was upon us. And he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay in wait by the way. This morning we talked about, when we was talking about seducing spirits and enemies, um, usually the enemy isn't visible. He's very slick, very sleek, uh, camouflage, so to speak. And he is very good at ambushes. So oftentimes for a Christian in the world we live in today, you're already jumped and knocked down on the road before you even realize the enemy was present. 
And that's important to understand when it comes to our walk. That's why being prepared is pretty important, uh, of utmost importance. Uh, because the enemy doesn't just show himself. The enemy lies in wait. He's just waiting for someone to kind of fall back a little bit. He's just waiting for somebody to turn his back on him. He's just waiting for somebody to be unawares of what's going on around him. And that is when uh, the enemy attacks. And I'll tell you what, if you want to you study an animal that knows how to ambush and how to attack covertly, study a pack of female lions. Um, you'll, you'll find some interesting things of how the enemy works just by looking at those. Well, maybe one day I'll preach a message on those guys. I've done it on eagles before, but uh, maybe lions would be a good one. Uh, but anyway, um, they're, they're very meticulous and patient. And they will, they will encamp somewhere where they know the prey is going to walk through. And they will stay there for hours without moving, just waiting for that caravan of whatever it is to walk through. And once they do, they find the weak one, and just like that. And they've got vision, they can see at night, uh, they can sense things, it's pretty amazing. Well, our enemy, doesn't the Bible say, uh, is like a lion seeking whom he may devour? Yeah, it's a pretty, uh, pretty massive foe that we are against. And then it says this, And we came to Jerusalem and abode three, there three days. Now on the fourth day was the silver and the gold of the vessels weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah the priest. And with him was Eleazar, the son of Phinehas. And with them, uh, Je jo Josabad, the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah. Remember Jeshua? Um, over there at the beginning of Ezra. Uh, and Noadiah, the son of Benai, Le uh, Levites. By number and by weight of every one, and all the weight was written at the time. And also the children of the house, children of those that had been carried away, which were come out of the captivity, offered burnt offerings unto the God of Israel, twelve bullocks for all Israel, ninety and six rams, seventy and seven lambs, twelve he goats for a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering unto the Lord. And then the Bible says, and they delivered the king's commission unto the king's lieutenants and the governors on this side of the river, and they furthered the people and the house of God. So they take the journey. They've been there for four days. Day four comes, uh, the morning hits, and off they go. Five months. This journey was long. It was treacherous. They had enemies by every way. Uh, they had no military defenses. Um, all they had was the hand of God upon them. Ezra makes that statement, the hand of God was upon us. He makes that statement in Ezra chapter 7, verse 9. He says, according to the good hand of his God upon him. And once again, Ezra gives all the credit for the protection that was afforded to them to who? Does he give it to his wisdom and leading? Does he give it to his strength in, in taking care of people? Does he give it to his zeal and his faithfulness? He gives it to God. You know, I... I uh, we, could, we can talk about being faithful almost like we're proud of it. But the truth of the matter is, whose faith is it? We say my faith and all this stuff. But what does the Bible say in Romans? Doesn't it say the just shall live by what? By faith. That is a quoted scripture out of the book of Habakkuk. And the Bible says in the book of Habakkuk, it said the just shall live by somebody. Remember our Habakkuk study? The just shall live by his faith. So it's God's anyway. So don't get proud over your strong faith. Thank God and give him the glory for it because he's the one that give it to you. Um, anyway, according to the good hand of it, God, once again, he, he gives all the credit to God uh, for the protection that he gave him uh, for all those that were lying in wait for them. And you see our enemy, our enemy's slick, he's covert, he ambushes us, um, he knows our ways, he knows our path. As a matter of fact, uh, there's only one entity that knows me. There's two. <laughs> Besides God, there's only one other entity that knows me better than me. And that is the enemy, Satan. God knows me very well. He knows everything about me. I know a lot about me. I know things that, about me that you don't know. You know things about you that I don't know. But there is one that knows even more about me. Than I do, and that one is Satan. So um, he knows how to lure me away. He knows how to tempt me. He knows how to 
He knows how to draw me. He knows how to seduce me. He knows how to trick me and, 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 and do all these things that will cause me just to scatter away just for a little while so that I'm no longer with the protection of the group and I can be attacked. He's pretty slick. He does lie in wait. He's seductive. Um, he, he's able to trick us and uh, cause us to be tossed to and fro with every whim of doctrine and all that stuff. We need to trust God, period, when it comes to those things. And at that point, God is our protector. He'll get the, uh, the, the victory for protecting us, and the good hand of our God will uh, be upon us. And what's interesting is the land that they were going through was all enemies, and it was a normal thing for that road to have people killed, have people robbed. Uh, you think of the old westerns, the stagecoaches driving uh, with the horses, and uh, you know they're out in the middle of nowhere, and just out of nowhere, a band of a group of bandits come up on horseback, and they stop the carriage, and they and then they take the pot of gold or whatever is in there. And um, so, of course, we know what happens two hours later. The hero kills them all and saves the woman, right? Uh, if you've seen one western, you've seen them all. <laughs> but, but anyway. Um, that's uh, what um, our God will do. He will take care of us when we're in these enemy lands. Um, second of all, um, they said on the fourth day, all the vessels and all the valuables uh, for the temple were delivered where? Where did they take them to? And who took them? Merimoth took them. Um, and when they took them there, so they, th just to give you the timeline, they, they, they were three days before they went out on their journey. They left in the morning. They took the long journey, and then they get there, and what did they do for the next three days? They rested. They just stopped, rested from the journey, and then the Bible says on the fourth day, that's when they got down to business. And you say, what's the, what, what, what are you trying to say there? What is, what's the point you're making there? The point is this. Sometimes in our journey here, um, we go through a serious time in our life, and when we finally get to the victory, it's always good to just sit down, take a deep breath, and rest for a little while. You say, well, i got to stay busy. I can't stop. I can't slow. You're not stopping and you're not slowing down. You know what you're doing? You're getting your breath back because of that journey and what it took out of you. You see, when we go to God to worship, God wants everything we have. And if we just got off of a long journey and our bodies are beaten down, um, God has no problem with us getting away for a little bit, taking a vacation. Um, and I'm not talking about just taking vacations to take vacations. I'm talking about away from the bustle of serving our faithful God. Didn't Jesus even have to get away for a little while? It, wasn't he wearied? And the Bible said, he said, I must, I must, I got to get away. So I'm going to go up here for a little bit. I got to rest. I got to take some time. And it was during that time, the Mount of Transfiguration and all that stuff, that it happened um, that uh, we see a great sight of Christ that shows us that he truly understands uh, how weary we can get in the world that we live in. Uh, so in the end, they arrived safely. They rest, they go to the temple, and to me, this is where it's really good. They had never worshipped in a temple before. They had never had their freedom before. I mean, you remember what happened when, when Persia took over? They just came out of the Babylonian, or out of the Babylonian captivity. They had been in captivity for a long time before they even went into the Persian captivity. So, they had never been to the Jerusalem temple before, ever. They might have heard stories and history and talking about it and how wonderful it was to uh, be in the will of God and go to that great temple and, and serve and worship and make these sacrifices and get to the holiest of and talk to God. They, all they would ever did was hear stories about it. Now they're there. Now they're standing there. They've rested for three days. I just want you to imagine just for a moment what must have been going through their hearts and their minds when they walked into that temple for the first time. Take that 
Multiply that by a thousand and picture yourself walking into that city built four square when we get to glory. You see, all we're doing now is talking about it. All we're doing now is reading about it. All we're doing now is looking forward to it, knowing that it's in our future. But we're not there yet. We're on that journey. We're on that five-month journey. We're on that long journey. We've got enemies on both sides and in front and behind us. We've got uh, uh, seducing spirits lying wait over here and lying wait over here. We've got false teachers throwing things at us. We've got, we've got enemies within and enemies without, and they're hiding and they're ambushing us, and they're trying to get us not to make it to where we need to go. But in the end, we're going to walk through those pearly gates. We're going to walk through that gate of pearl. We're going to walk up that river of life. We're going to walk up that golden street. We're going to walk up to that throne that the river of life flows freely from. We're going to take whatever kind of fruit we want to take because there's a tree that bears all manner of fruit. And we're going to walk up and we're going to see our Lord and Savior for the first time in the flesh in front of us. Isn't that going to be a good day? If that don't excite you, there's something broke in your heart. You say, well, I'm not that excited of a person. There ought to be something dancing around in your heart right now because we're going to get there. We are going to take that journey. We are going to get out of this captivity of this flesh that we are in right now. God has given us the liberty. We live in a country that has afforded us these liberties of freedom of religion, these liberties to have a church, to run the church, to be an autonomous enemy that's self-governed. There is not a country in the world that has that. Do you understand that? There is not one country in the whole entire world that has the freedom of li or the liberty to worship God the way that America does. It's pretty good. We've got the king's favor. We've got the, uh, God's protection. The great hand of God is upon us. And we've got his promise that one day we're going to walk through those, those pearly gates and we're going to see him for who he is. And that is our great God and king, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So the takeaway, and last thing here and we'll be done here. I want you to look at verse 36. Verse 36. And this, this, this just kind of puts the icing on the cake here for this chapter. The Bible says, and they delivered the king's commissions unto the king's lieutenants and the governors on this side of the river, and they furthered the people in the house of God. That word further there. So they get there, they take the rest, and then they take care of the king's people, the lieutenants and the governors. They go to them and say, here we are, thank you, uh, here's the decree of our tax receipts, um, and here's what he wants and you know what the Bible says that those lieutenants did? It says furthered. That word furthered in verse 36 basically means the lifting of a burden. It doesn't mean push. It means a lifting. A, 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 there's a sense there that the Persian officials did all that they could to make the way for God's children as easy and trouble-free as they had the authority to do so. So that is basically this. Remember all the trouble that uh, they had in that first going out with the, the people from the other side of the river that kept stopping the work of God? And remember what Cyrus and, and um, um, the other Artaxerxes did? And uh, Dar Remember what they did? They stopped, they give them, they stopped, they give them, but each time they gave them more liberty, they gave them even more now they've got complete and full liberty. Not only are they allowed to do what they're allowed to do, but they've got the help to make the job easier. Now you say, well, how, how, how could they have made the job easier? Well, I would imagine uh, they made some, some laws in the land that allowed God's people to do what God's people needed to do. You see, our country has some laws too. And those laws protect us. It's called our Constitution. It's called our Bill of Rights. Um, and because of that, those statements, God has basically, as the song says, shed his grace upon me. Now, if we don't exercise that liberty, and we don't exercise it properly in the right way, how long do you think it will be before we lose the favor and the good hand of our God? You say, well, we're still going to heaven, yeah. But how many of those things are going to be taken away because we're not using them anyway? That's why I believe as Cornerstone Baptist Church, whether we have 
one person, 10 people, 50 people, 100 people, 500 people. I want everybody in our congregation to exercise every right that they have to come and worship God in a building, to go and worship God in public. Stand on a street corner and pass out a gospel track. Stand on a bus, at a bus station and, and say, thus saith the Lord. Hand the gospel tracks out to people you talk to. Carry your Bible with you when you go places. Open your Bible up and talk to people. Go before the city officials and give them gospel tracks. You've got every right to. If you see a policeman on the side of the road and he's, he's walking, reach out and give him a gospel track. Say, well, he'll, he ain't going to arrest you, especially in this community. He may wad it up and throw it away. But every cop I've dealt with here, like them, lump them, do whatever you want with them, I've never had one not take a gospel track when I offered to him. I saw one take it and then read it and throw it away, but he took it. So think about that. Exercise your liberties. Trust God and understand that one day we're going to come to Jerusalem.
everything that we've read about in the Word of God. Let's stand, let's pray. Let's close in prayer.